everybody. Good morning. Good morning. If you're keeping score, we've had what uh, the choir sang. Excellent job, as always. The children's time, excellent job, as always. Two uh, checks on the scorecard. Now comes the boring part. <laughs> Anybody needs to catch up on your sleep? Uh, let's see if we can't work something out together. You see if you can sleep. I'll see if I can keep you awake. How about that? John chapter 17. John chapter 17. I'm glad Carol came back in. I thought I was going to have to send somebody to go get her. Some people you just got to watch. If you're not sure about that, I can tell. You don't see what I see. But anyway, John 17. Uh, entitled the message this morning, Part 8. That took a lot of meditation to come up with that. Part 8. We've been studying about Jesus being the high priest, the high priest in action, if you will, uh, in story number 8. John 17, let me read verse 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come, glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. Verse 3. This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. And verse 11, Now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. We're studying John chapter 17, the high priestly prayer, uh, as scholars generally refer to uh, John chapter 17. And in this chapter, Jesus is showing uh, very plainly things about himself seen nowhere else in Scripture. Now, I'll grant you, Old Testament writings, uh, he's seen in the shadow of, of the Old Testament priest. Uh, New Testament writings, he is described and taught about as the great high priest. But in John 17, he's actually showing himself to his disciples, and as a matter of fact, showing himself to anybody who really wants to see uh, through the Word of God that he is in fact the great high priest of the Christian faith, Hebrews 4.14. And he really is that mediator between God and men, the man, Jesus Christ, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 5. Now, if you're anything like me, and I think I use that preface often here, and I hope you're not, but the tendency is to mentally file away all of these uh, scholarly sounding phrases like the one I borrowed from the scholars, the high priestly prayer, or Jesus is the great high priest. I've got the tendency to file that somewhere uh, under theology, you know, quote unquote. Who in the world knows what that means? That's the name of some joker that comes from Greece somewhere, I guess. File it under a, 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 the heading of it's important, but it's not practical, maybe. Or how about this, file it under uh, the heading of its good meditative reading, but it's not really anything useful. Or my favorite one, file something like this under the heading of, we'll understand it better by and by, let's talk about something simple, how about that? But, if what we're told in John 17 is true, and we know it is, because it's the Word of God, and Numbers 23, 19 says God's not a man that he should ever lie. Aren't you glad? Yeah. And wouldn't it be something to stand before God? But you said, yeah, but I didn't mean it. <laughs> Being a mess then, wouldn't we? If what we're told in John 17, Jesus is still doing, and we know that he is, because the Bible says, Hebrews 13, 8, 
Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? I'm at somewhere with this. If what we're told is true, if what he was doing, he's still doing, then what we're seeing in John 17 is wonderfully incredible. It's remarkably fantastic. And I made this one up. It's hippopotamusly good. <laughs> Can anybody follow that one? I didn't know what else to say. You know, it's, it's off the scale, y'all. What we're seeing here. He said, well, to me, the Bible is not relevant. It's because you don't want it to be. If you think life is fine and you can just coast in your Corvair for the rest of your life, this book will never be anything but something to keep your pictures in. But if you're like me, and like I know you really are, you wouldn't be here. You have found that Christianity to you is not an option. You need Christ. I need it. I mean, I need Him. So we get in the book and we find out glorious, wonderful things. Number one, He has direct access to God the Father and nobody else does. Nobody. Well, I thought I did. Wrong. Number two, Bible believers get to listen in to these prayers. Nobody else does. Number three, he's talking to God about we Bible believers and no one else. Number four, he's talking to God for we Bible believers and no one else. And the fifth one's the one I like real good. He's asking God on our behalf for the things he knows we really need. <coughs> And y'all, this is at least one place where the bear comes down the tree. <clears throat> one of the precious few places we get to listen in to Jesus talking to the Father. And y'all, don't stash that away under, you know, Bible talk somewhere. This is the Son who's intimate with the One who made everything. Chatting. And we get to listen in. He's praying for what He knows we need. Now, does anybody here realize major difference between wants and needs? And remember that? I'm, hey, I know I'm a quote-unquote preacher, although some of you ain't sure about that. That's fine with me. A few more years, all I'll be is a name on maybe a tombstone if they decide to go for it. All right? But, if what I'm telling you is coming out of here, you at least got to take that part. There's a major difference between what we want and what we need. I want, you know, uh, what, what does somebody want here? Don't, don't, don't answer that, because you'll have to say something that will just tick me off. And I'm allowed to get long-winded. <laughs> What is it that every disciple of Jesus really needs? In a word, you know, I searched the world over, and this is what I could come up with, to be ready. That's what we need. We may want a new truck, especially Al, but it's broken. We may want a big lunch, and I got plans. And we may want a lot of things, y'all, but the, the bottom line for the Bible believer, the disciple of Christ, is to be ready. That's what we need. In such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Matthew 24, 44. Now again, if there's anybody here that's like me, used to when I heard that, as a lost person, made me mad right away. Why don't you talk about something fun? You know, why don't you talk about who beat who in college football yesterday? What is this business about Jesus returning? You don't really believe he's coming back, do you? Uh-huh. Amen. Amen. And since he's God, and by the way, for some of y'all who live down here where I am, that means he's got the big stick. He's large and in charge. He makes all the rules. And your vote don't count. Y'all ain't helping me. <laughs> you know how hard it is to preach, uh, preach to people who won't help you. 
That's how you get. Listen, I ain't. You see all this white? I ain't been 30 years old. <laughs> he lied in church. See that thing right there? That takes care of everything. Whether it be the trumpet sound or the angels of death, we really need to be ready. Amen? Now, I get excited. I, I don't act like this in food line, just in case you're wondering. <laughs> well, what does ready look like? <laughs> that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 1.8. What's ready look like? That you may be blameless and harmless. The sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. Philippians 2.15 What does ready look like? I pray God your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 Blameless. That's ready. Blameless. Quite an order. Billy just told us and the children, through Christ we can do anything, Amen. even be blameless. Mm -hmm. well, how about that? But that's why we hear Jesus the high priest praying in John chapter 17, verse number 11. Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me. You see, Jesus knows we need keeping. Jesus knows we need a keeper. It's what we talked about last time. And Jesus shows us that our keeper is God the Father. So you see, our joy uh, is threefold when we read a verse uh, like verse 11. He knows what we really need. He's asking the Father to literally meet that need. And then thirdly, we know that this is what the Father is willing to do for us. Did anybody, I wonder, and I ain't going to ask you to answer because you'll hurt my feelings if you don't answer it right. Did anybody this week actually stop and think about the fact that you've got a keeper and his name is God the Almighty? He, he's kept us this week. He's guarded, preserved, watched over, and protected. That's why we're here. <laughs> Amen. But notice next verse 11. Father that they may be one as we are. Now again, we're showing three things, if you will. Number one, Jesus knows what we really need. And that is in the church to be one. Number two, Jesus is asking the Father to literally meet this need. Right? Or he wouldn't have been praying it. What that is, it will only be by the work of God, that a church can be one. And three, we know that this too is what the Father is willing to do for us. God wants us to be one. And it can literally happen if we'll let God do it. First of all, what is it to be one in the church? Now this is deep. You may need to get two pencils out and write this down, Jerry. What is one? Not two. You don't think that's deep? <laughs> <clears throat> what is one? It means no divisions, no schisms. What is one in the church?